London, heart of man's mightiest commonwealth of nations, where millions struggle that human free will shall not vanish from the earth. London, where the fate of the world revolves around the proud spires of St. Paul's and the Towers. As the jaunty New Zealanders march from Guildhall, one might well imagine that the empire is at peace instead of at war. At the Royal Exchange, colonial troops entertain atop an air raid shelter. For a year, London has awaited the threatened blitzkrieg of the dictator who assumes divinity while inflicting devilish cruelty. Denied their annual vacations, carefree Londoners take to city pools as substitutes for the more elegant seaside attractions of Ramsgate and Brighton. It is the lull before the storm. A city of initials, London is ready for Goering's threatened total air war. A city of sandbags. The determination of strong hearts is encased in these sandbags to protect live property, statues and public buildings especially to protect the home of the premiers on Downing Street. Rigid police rules guard the entrance to number 10, the premier's official domain. Admiralty Arch is guarded by soldiers instead of sailors, but Trafalgar Square is open to all. Colonial troops loll about with sleepy indifference, making friends with doves and lovey doves while from a lofty perch, a visiting band plays lively airs for a cosmopolitan audience. Jack Tars and Tommies join the general sit-around, while the appeasers predict that Nazis will not dare to bomb London. At London Bridge in town, and at Stable Inn with its old gardens, London is normal everywhere. Little does this great city of a million homes realize the impending disaster. The war seems a million miles away. History is made in the stillness of the night. Keen-eyed spotters scan the night sky, and mechanical ears are always on the alert. Searchlights swing into action as silver pencils of light grope the clouds for possible raiders. Then, terror on wings. Flying devils of war lunge at the heart of humanity. The sirens dread along. Now the heroic RAF Spitfires leap into action. Through the darkness, hurl the bombs. With tons of flames spurting from incendiary fires along the waterfront, trembling babies cower in their frightened mother's arms, and the injured shriek amid the weird clamor of London's frightful disaster. The morning after finds a different London. That first staggering assault, a brutal war on nerves, proved the English have nerve. St. Paul's, that was later ruined by bombs, looks down on an inferno of desolation. London's morale was Hitler's objective, but in one night London becomes a city of fighters, frontline fighters, firemen and the home guard, with pickaxe, fire hose and courage. Destruction everywhere. Walls and windows are shattered, but not the morale. So London comes up smiling. With bulldog tradition, all London carries on. It's just another day for busy people with tired eyes and strong hearts. The great metropolis is again serene, while hurrying crowds afoot and a wheel give little signs of defeat. These Londoners are going to their daily work after a frightful smear of hate in history's most gruesome warfare, the unequal war of civilians against soaring demons of the air.
and the ravagers of cities who slaughter the unarmed may come again tonight and tomorrow night. Hit back posters announce the bravery of London which sets itself to carry on. A member of the AFS rescues a wax figure as carefully as he would a strawberry blonde. Shops reopen almost before incendiary fires cool. Undaunted merchants rise above Holocaust horror to maintain business as usual. They cannot stop for new windows, of course, but mix optimism with grit in keeping things moving. It wasn't only the West End that got all the blasting. Here, south of the Thames, suffered more. Lambeth Walk, with real cockney humor, keeps smiling. Where ale is a tonic for the tongue, lads and lassies slur their enemies with sizzling contempt. Every blitz deserves a blister, says the Limehouse philosopher, while raising funds for spitfires, give every enemy bomber the machine gun hot tail. Anything from a German helmet to grandmother's shawl is in the rummage sale for the Spitfire Fund. And nearby is a fallen plane, which is a great attraction. One of Goering's yellow jackets that found British bullets too much for it. There's no argument about it, a Messerschmitt is a paying attraction. Precaution against a ton of high explosives menacing a beautiful cathedral. London's newly formed bomb squad handling terrific potential death cools off a time bomb. Facing eternity every time they perform a task like this, the members of the Suicide Squad are outstanding heroes among a city of heroes. The monument marking the site of the start of the first great fire of London 400 years ago sees this new fire at its very base. The great fire of 1666 beat the firemen, but today the firemen beat the fire. The famous church of St. John the Evangelist, again surrounded by flames, but this time the church is saved, together with its priceless stained glass window. Gloating dictators said that London was starving, but here they are given the lie direct with the full force of Billingsgate colorful language. Thousands of Britons fond of seafood are fed from this rich bounty of the sea. And the clutching crabs are always a popular delicacy. Billingsgate horses grow mustaches, as much a tradition as the porter's leather helmets now being replaced by metal mushrooms. Packing up bloaters that no longer are floaters is a joy with a good mug of beer. Workers gaze at the newest military target. Of course, a ruthless up small nations doesn't hesitate about blasting a London gas main. But without gas or shop, the coffee shop man renders his patrons the latest air-conditioned service. And why not? Sidewalk dining was popular in the West End long before the Blitz. Jellied eels never tasted so well indoors as they do in the fresh air, or a spot of tea either, especially under the portals of London's other St. Paul's in Covent Garden, where every porter carries his head as high as his courage. Vegetables are important British needs, and here trade carries on, with cats a part of the market family. Morning Minnie, the air raid siren blares again. Jim Crow, the observer aloft, scans the heavens with sharp eyes. But no longer does London stop at every alert signal. The country's needs rise above fear and personal danger. Only when the attack is near is a signal given to take cover. All eyes look upward. There's trouble in the air. A flock of Messerschmitts swoop down to drop steel and fire on London. Tracer bullets, like avenging fingers, point out the raiders. A breathtaking spectacle. The most exciting actual battle scenes ever photographed. Balloons are 
are targets for swift Stuka dive bombers that spat a machine gun slug. A bomber is hit and flops over in the last dive it will ever take. Terror brings glory. The ambulance corps are heroes of every emergency. An all clear signal. The plunderers of peace have gone and London is itself again. But the anti-aircraft gunners have an all around the clock job. Bertha, the barrage balloon, lazily returns to earth for inspection and perhaps for repairs from machine gun bullets. Nazi flyers trapped by searchlights or foiled by a terrific anti-aircraft barrage plunge to earth in dozens. Hankles, hankles everywhere, but they will never fly again. A direct denial of the squadron's illustrated boast showing its eagle mascot defeating a lion. Women and children first, seemed the Nazi Air Force motto. Hospitals were not spared, and pallid invalids turned out of their beds bear their multiplied dangers as bravely as Nurse Cavill faced her executioners in 1915. Even churches are desecrated in the frightful scourge of hate. Holy faces on saintly images stare in mute disapproval at the abomination of cruelty. Lordly edifices that were the wonder of the world, are dashed to dust, while hell seems to spew forth the venom of murder. Bravely, London fights back. The tireless rescuers search ruins for the victims. Consider London, a city of homes, of fathers, mothers, and children, of millions strong in sublime family love, living in homes that are mansions of the rich, and homes of the poor, many homes now ruined where once the old sat peacefully in cozy corners and new life flowed from mother's breasts into the mouths of their babies. The light of day is fading and workers with uncertain transportation hurry home or down to the home of the homeless in the clattering subway where hundreds huddle together and are able to smile even on a bed of concrete. The way to safety, downstairs to a bed in a daze of fearful childhood. Guns that battered Napoleon's army are to be made into new instruments of defense, to be again melted into steel, steel to make guns, steel to make shells, shells that are fast becoming a Nazi nightmare. With the machinery of industry geared full speed ahead, master and men are welded together for the common welfare of the nation. Work is unceasing, work that is vital, work that is constructive, work that is destructive. Britain's guardians are prepared, they will not fail. And while the city sleeps, its defenders start the noisy lullaby of London. London's trust is rich with hope, for the democracies of the world are uniting, and free men like an avalanche are gathering to crush tyranny. Yes, civilization hangs in the balance, but civilization will endure because while London can take it, London can give it too. <laughs>